continuing in our series from the book of Hebrews. So if you'd like to turn with me in your scriptures to Hebrews chapter 4. The series is titled, Jesus is Enough, and today's message is, as Sue said, he's all we need. And the truth is that we'll look at today, it's one of the most amazing revelations that are in the Bible. That Jesus Christ, because of his human experience on earth, he can sympathize with he can empathize with us in our times of deepest sorrow and our moments of greatest joy. And we can pray confidently, knowing that he completely understands all that we're experiencing because he's been where we are. No matter who we are or where we've been on our journey with Christ, there'll inevitably come a time in your life where you feel that nobody on earth can understand your situation. 
Even our most intimate friends or our spouses or parents will not be able to feel what's going on in our lives. Ever had that kind of experience? And sometimes our questions and doubts may not even be translatable in words and will ache for someone to whom we can go with, with our soul's needs. And this section of Hebrews talks about that some. The writer of Hebrews speaks to him, Jesus, as our great high priest. And in our previous messages, the high priestly ministry of Jesus has been either referenced to or spoken of specifically. In chapter 1, verse 3, we were told that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in chapter 2, we were told that we have a merciful and faithful high priest. And so here we are on this journey for say, from our Egypt to the promised land. From our salvation in Christ until the time we get to heaven, we're in this in-between time, so to speak. Pilgrims and strangers, they say. And we have the Word of God, and we have God in heaven, but there's one more piece to the puzzle here that the writer wants us to acknowledge. And that is we also have this person in heaven whose specific responsibility and promise is that he can help us in any and every situation that we face. So with that in mind, let's look at a few verses together. And our first point of this message is, is that we have a heavenly high priest. Hebrews 4.14 says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, who is this high priest? And what's our relationship with him? And to answer that, we're going to ask just a couple questions. And the first question to this point is, first of all, whose is he? Well, that kind of sounds like not very good English or not very good sentence, but it is a really good sentence. Whose is this high priest? Notice in the scripture verse, it says, we have a great high priest. Whose is this high priest? Every one of us. It's us. We have him. If you're a Christian, Jesus Christ is your great high priest. He's your priest. So let me say it this way. He is your high priest as if you were the only one who needed a great high priest. He's yours. He's not just ours as a church. He's yours. He's mine. He belongs to us. And he wants us to take ownership of him in his role as our high priest. Whose he is. The second question we ask is what he is. What is a great high priest? Well, this is a reference back to the Old Testament. This book that we're studying was written primarily to the, to the Hebrews, but it has an application to all of us. And all of the Hebrews would have known what high priest did. I mean, let's face it, here in the Wesleyan Church, we don't really know much about priests. But the Hebrew West, the Hebrew Wesleyans, they weren't Wesleyan, but the Hebrews knew about priests. They knew from the Old Testament that the priests were appointed by God to be the mediators between God and man. So the writer of Hebrews refers to Jesus Christ not just as a priest, or even just a high priest, but as our great high priest. The Bible says when Jesus finished his atonement for our sins, and we're told that he went into the holiest of holies. He went into the very real presence of God, the holiest of all holies, and presented the blood of his own sacrifice. And the scriptures say after having done that, he sat down at the right hand of God. We said it before. Did he do this because he was tired? No, because it was finished. The sacrifice was made by the perfect high priest. The sacrifice itself was perfect. The animal sacrifices would never have to again occur to atone for the sins of God's people. Hebrews 9.12 says it this way, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The interesting thing that is the death of Jesus Christ was the end of the Jewish priesthood and sacrifices as they were known. Whose he is? He's my high priest. He's your high priest. 
We have him. What he is, he's the great high priest. And here's the third question. Where he is? The Bible says that he's in heaven. Did you know that when Jesus was on this earth during his incarnation, he functioned primarily as a prophet? He forth told the word of God. He acted as a prophet. And the Bible also tells us that one day he's coming back. And it says that when he comes back, he was going to come back as our king. But in between this role as a prophet while he was on this earth and his role as a king when he comes back, he functions as our priest. He's our priest in heaven, taking care of intercedings for us. And that's so necessary. Whose he is, what he is, and where he is. And finally, the last question in this point is kind of like the first question, but not really. Who he is? Who is he? It says in our scripture verse, notice it says, this is Jesus, the Son of God. This puts together in one phrase all of his humanity and all of his deity. Jesus Christ in his human nature and the Son of God in his divine nature. And just in case we've forgotten who this great high priest is, the writer wants us to remind us that our high priest is none other than Jesus, the Son of God. And here's an interesting thought, and I don't want you to, to, to miss. And just kind of listen a little bit carefully because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. When Jesus left this earth to go back into heaven, he did not lay aside his humanity. When he ascended into heaven and he came back and he visited the disciples, they recognized him. How did they recognize him? Because he was still in his humanity. He still had the scars in his hands and the scars in his feet. He did not lay aside his humanity to go back to heaven. Jesus is in heaven as in his humanity, like he was after his resurrection on earth. Now that's kind of hard to grasp. And when we pray to Jesus, we're not only praying to Jesus, the Son of God, we're praying to Jesus who in his humanity right now is at the very hand, the right hand of the Father. And I don't know about you, but that helps me and encourages me to, because sometimes I think, well, maybe he's back in heaven and he's got this spiritual form like his father, but the Bible says that he never laid aside his humanity. In fact, the Bible says it this way, there is one God and one man between God and man, and who is that? It's the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the scripture says he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See, when Jesus answers our prayers in heaven, he answers those prayers as if he were right here in his resurrected body interacting with us. Person to person. Human to human. And that's why we can have such great confidence when we go to him. He's not just the son of God. He is Jesus, the son of God. He is our great high priest. And so our first point was that we have this heavenly high priest, but it brings us to the second point. Because we have this heavenly high priest, we have a human responsibility. Because notice what it says in the second half of verse 14. It says, because of everything I've told you so far, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. See, our confession is important. The Bible says that with our mouths, we profess our faith. Why do you think every time we step up to the pulpit, we ask for praises? Confession is extremely important. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians today who have joined the secret service. Did you know that? Have you ever noticed that? That there's a lot of Christians that are kind of underground Christians. They're covert Christians, so to speak. But the Bible says if we're going to make it through this wilderness, if we're not going to, if we're going to get from this Egypt that we're in, so to speak, to the promised land, if we're going to experience our quest for the best, we need to understand the importance of holding firmly to our confession, not being ashamed of who he is. Because let me tell you, we not only confess Christ with our lips, but we also confess Christ with our lives. It's not just what we say, but it's what we do. And here's the interesting thing. 
is that the writers of Hebrews is telling us to confess Christ, to hold fast to this confession, this profession of faith, not simply because it's a requirement, but that it will benefit our walk with him. Did you know that when you're outward with your faith, when we profess or confess Christ openly, it gives us courage to face the challenges of the day because we've declared whose we are. We've declared our allegiance to this high priest who is in heaven. And if we're walking in fellowship with him, somehow our walk will be stronger and our steps will be brighter and we'll get through the wilderness a whole lot better than we would if we tried to do it as a covert Christian. We have a heavenly high priest and we have a human responsibility, but also we have a human high priest. Because notice what it says in verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. See, our high priest in heaven, as I have already told you on who's, who he is, he's Jesus Christ in his resurrected body, still in his humanity. And the Bible says that this Jesus, who is our heavenly high priest, is also our human high priest. And because of that, he can sympathize or empathize with our weaknesses. See, whenever you go to Jesus and whatever is going on in your heart, you tell him what you're going through and he's already been there, done that. And he knows exactly what you're experiencing. The Bible says he empathizes with you. And this word empathize is made up of two words which means to suffer with. It means he doesn't just look upon the things that we're going through or the sufferings from the outside and try to get a gauge on it. The Bible says that he enters into our suffering and literally suffers with us. No matter what it is that we're experiencing, Jesus sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. He sympathizes with us when we're without strength and the verse tells us that not only can he sympathize with us in our time of testing or our time of needs, but he can also strengthen us in our time of temptation. Because notice at the end of verse 15, it says, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Hebrews 2.18 puts it this way, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. He's seen it all. He's felt it all. And he understands what we're going through in your life and in mine. And, and you may think or say, you know, I'm, I'm under su such temptation pressure right now. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overcome you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, he'll also provide the way out so that you can endure it. See, we have someone in heaven who feels our suffering, but also understands our temptation. And in fact, it's interesting in Hebrews 2.17, we're told that Jesus was, for this reason, had to be made like us. And in Hebrews 4.15, we're told that he was tempted in all points. He was made in all things like us, and he was tempted in all points like us. And because of that, he knows what we experience. He was made like us so he could minister to us. We have this heavenly high priest and a human responsibility, but we also have a human high priest for number four, but we also have a heavenly responsibility. Notice verse 16. It says, let us then, because we have this human high priest, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The scripture says that because we have this human high priest who can identify with our infirmities, who understands our temptations, we have this heavenly responsibility. <laughs> and what's that responsibility? Look at what it says. It says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Now in this verse, it, it asks, helps us to ask three questions, and it's all about prayer. 
And the first question is, why should we pray? It says, let us come, therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Boldly doesn't mean disrespectful. Boldly doesn't mean get up in God's face. Boldly literally means in the text itself, it means to come to God in prayer, letting it all go. Saying it all. That's what the word means. It says, come saying it all, putting it all on the table and leaving nothing out. Tell God everything there is to tell. Pray your prayers in high definition, so to speak. Tell God what's going on in your life and in your experiences. Tell him everything you're facing and don't leave out any details. So how should we pray? We should come boldly. The second question is, what should we pray? Our verse tells us that we should pray so we could obtain mercy and find grace. Very simply, that means mercy for the things we've already done and grace for the stuff we're going through. How many of you know that there's not hardly a day that goes by that we don't need God's mercy for something we already did? Every one of us should need to know that we need to throw ourselves to the, to the mercy of God. Lord, I never meant for that to happen. Please have mercy on me and forgive me. We come to him and ask for forgiveness. And he does. He forgives. But the Bible also says that we come saying it all to the throne of grace. And we ask for mere mercy for what we've done. And grace for what's going on in our lives right now. How should we pray? What should we pray? And finally the third question is why should we pray? The Bible says that we should pray that we may obtain help in our time of need. And I'll tell you why. We're in a time of need right now. As a nation, as families, as individuals, there's never been a better time for this message than this time. The Bible says we come and we ask for God's grace and his mercy, and we ask him to help us in our time of need. And the word help here is an interesting word. It's only found in one other place in the New Testament. And it's a really interesting picture. The word help here is also found in Acts 27, 17. And it says when they had taken on board, they were talking about a ship out in the, in the seas and the storm was coming and it was in danger of falling apart. They used cables to undergird the ship. And the word undergird here is the same word that they use in the Greek language for this word help. Get the picture. This ship had so much cargo in it that it wasn't strong enough to get through the storm, so they undergirded with cables. They wrapped, literally wrapped the boat with cables. And in the same way we come to God in our need, he undergirds us with his strong, loving arms and makes it possible for our ship to get through the storm and not get blasted out of the water. That's the kind of help we need. Amen? We need God to undergird us sometimes. We need Him to come with His strength in our weaknesses and put His strong arms under us to help us get through the storms of life. And we pray to Him that we might find that help in our time of need. Now, I don't know what you're going through in your life today. I know what some of you are going through. But there are times, as I said in the beginning, we have these times when we don't even have words to utter or someone to stand beside us. But it's in those times we need to come to him for his strength. Those times we come to him in our weaknesses, allow him to put his strong arms under us and help us get through. Because we have a high priest in heaven seated on the throne of majesty at the right hand of God. He's offered up the sacrifice for our sin, and he's there in his body making intercession for you and me. And experiencing with us everything we experience, sympathizing with us in our infirmities. Identifying with us in our temptations, and he comes to us with one glorious invitation. He comes to us saying, my children, come before the throne of grace, saying it all. Asking for mercy for the things of the past and grace for the things of the present and the future. Find your help there to get through the storm. As our worship team comes back, I've been saying this through this series and I say it again, I recommend Jesus. 
He's all we need. He's enough. If you want to know him more personally, spend time in it. it we, we talk about coming to an altar and eat. Spend time at his feet. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the word. I want to be your priest today between you and God. God loves you so much. Christ died for each and every one of us. We know folks that don't know him personally. Every one of us do. You be their priest between them and God. And profess your faith. Let them know that Jesus is all they need. Because when we put our, our trust in him, we not only get to go to heaven to be with God forever, but we, and we have this promise that he comes and he lives in our heart and he undergirds us and gives us strength for the day. Got me longing for yesterday